We've been doing a series about Christ's two-stage commissioning of Paul, and this will be part four. And we had seen, uh, talked about Paul, uh, Christ's early sending of Paul. First he was, uh, what's the word, separated, separated unto the gospel of God. He was separated from his mother religion in Galatians, I believe it's Galatians 4, and in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, we're told that he was separate, who he was separated to, he was separated to the gospel of God, and he went immediately, saved in, in uh, Acts 9, verse 6, and he went immediately to uh, to speak in the synagogue and uh, that Jesus is the Christ instead of that Jesus is not the Christ as he had gone after people that believed that he was, Jesus was Christ. So he started preaching that Jesus is the Christ in uh, Acts 9.20, Acts 9.22, Acts 9.27, and Acts 9. 29. But then in Acts 13, we find he's uh, being commissioned, sent, uh, uh, apostolized, I guess you could say, apostled to, uh, to uh, the work, is it? I think it was the work, wasn't it? Yes, that was the work. Uh, that was prophesied in Habakkuk 1.5, but it, he wasn't doing the prophet's work. He, and he, <laughs> he was, we'll get into that later in either tonight or tomorrow. N uh, well, it'd be next Thursday. No, yeah, Thursday I should be here. Friday I'll have a rehearsal dinner, so I have to skip a week from tonight. Um, but having seen Christ's early sending of Paul, as well as Christ's later promise of sending Paul in the future from the time he was told, uh, we now can see Paul in Philippians chapter 4, verse 15, where he reports the time when Christ actually did send him to begin preaching to that wider all-man audience, all-man, all-humans. <laughs> And soon we'll take a look at that. We need to see the difference in the wording of the earlier and later statements of Christ's sending of Paul. In other words, we need to look at the early sending and see how that sending was worded. I now send you, and our send thee. And the later sending, uh, where he sent him to all people, and it's worded, I will send you, send thee, I will send thee. So, uh, think with me about this. If I tell, uh, if I tell Donna, I'm going to send you for pizzas, have I sent her yet? That's telling something I'm going to do in the future, isn't it? It's not sending her yet. I would have to say, go get four pizzas. That would be sending her. Uh, what about if I tell Carl, I will send you for Subway sandwiches? Is he ready to go and uh, he knows how many? And, and No, I haven't told him to go yet. I told him that I will tell him. Well, in Acts 22, verse 21, And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. That's a future sending. It's a sending about the. <laughs> it's a report that Christ is going to send Paul later on sometime. Now that time has come, and, you know, I mean, he, it's already happened, but it didn't happen in Acts 22 when he talked about it. It happened when he was sent, and we'll find out when that was in a minute here. But. Uh, up until now, we've talked about that later stage of Christ's sendings of Paul, beginning even later into the future, because 
even when he said it, uh, Christ didn't say, I send thee. Christ said, I will send thee. So we know it was even later than that first sending. We know they were separate sendings from that. Well, now we're going to look at when Christ actually sent Paul, apostling with him uh, that later ministry, uh, uh, apostling it to him, I guess you could say, sending him on that later ministry to all men to go dispense or testify the gospel of the grace of God to all men. Philippians 4.15 refers back to Acts 20, verse 6, as being the time when Paul departed from Macedonia, Philippi, Macedonia, in the beginning of the gospel. Uh, there is the time marker right there in, in the scripture. It's a time marker that we can, uh, we can work from. Uh, it tells us when Christ actually ordained Paul to begin dispensing the gospel of the grace of God to all people, to an audience including Jews and Greeks, but further, to all men. Let's look at those verses. Philippians 4.15 Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia no church communicated with me concerning, as concerning giving and receiving but ye only. Thank you for posting those. That helps. Uh, but it's got the, the clause in there, in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia. So it tells us something, doesn't it? That verse, in the verse we see that Paul himself actually pinpoints when was the beginning of the gospel of the grace of God being preached, be, being testified. Well, before we read Acts 20, verse 6, let's look for clarity and for clarification, look in Acts 16, verse 12. Acts 16, verse 12. And then we'll go to Acts 20, verse 6. So, Acts 16, 12. And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a, co uh, a colony. So, we're told here in the Bible that Philippi is the chief city of part of Macedonia. N there we can, we can see that Philippi is, uh, it's not exactly the same. It's like Chicago is part of Illinois. Philippi is part of Macedonia. Now let's read Acts 20 verse 6 with that in mind. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto, uh, came unto them to Troas in five days where we abode seven days. And can you see that Acts 20 verse 6 fulfills what Paul said in Philippians 4.15. He said, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia. Well, that would be the same thing as saying when I departed from Philippi, Macedonia. But the... Uh, the thing here is that uh, it's that's the beginning of the gospel when he sailed away uh, or departed. And let me just comment on this uh, that is going to come up, I'm sure, sooner or later. You may have heard it already. Um, it's become obvious, though, in these verses that this is not a hybrid of two philosophies or positions or uh, doctrines or teachings. It is straight from the scriptures. We've done nothing but look at the scriptures and ascertain what they're saying and post them. Some of them have been overlooked or ignored by those who do don't understand it or by those who think they would lose something by believing those scriptures too. Believing the scriptural report of both stages of Christ's sendings of Paul 
is the receiving of the facts of Scripture, whether or not a person understands them yet. We need to believe the Scripture, especially when we don't understand it. If you only believe what you understand, then you're only believing yourself. There are no contradictions or additions needed when the scriptures are all taken together and applied to the people groups to whom they were addressed. And don't grab what is Israel's doctrine and claim that it was written to you. You will just be disappointed in the end. God did not say to Israel that uh, Israel's doctrine was to you. He didn't give it to you. He only said it to Israel. There are existing philosophies that see parts of the truth and try to supply theories to make the doctrines fit with their theory. But they fall short. They all fall short of the scriptural truth that people can get out of the scriptures just by believing the scriptures as they're written and to whom they're written. You have to study, yeah. That's why we meet together, to study and to fellowship, and that's what we do. We, we study to find out what the scriptures are saying, not what we can build on top of it or claim it to say. In studying the scriptures, believers are edified coming to the knowledge of the truth, and that's God's will. Let's look at some of the, uh, the philosophies that, that uh, are involved and that we're accused of sometimes. The Acts 28 philosophy misses the start of the body of Christ in Acts 9 verse 6 with salvation, the salvation of Paul into Christ's one body. That happened when Paul was saved. Uh, he, it's not a two-stage salvation. It was all at once. He was saved as a sinner, not as a justified person, somehow justified, uh, unforgivable in Israel's doctrine. So he wasn't justified. He was a sinner. So the Acts 28 philosophy must relegate all of Paul's Acts period teachings as being only to Israel, not to us, to the body of Christ, not to the body of Christ. It's true that the Bible does, doesn't say, uh, it's not in the Bible that Paul understood his new position in Acts 9, what, it all, what, <laughs> what all had happened, uh, but it does say that that is when God changed him and started revealing the accompanying change in doctrine to him for us it was for us, revealed to Paul for us uh, with that in mind uh, if you're resisting Paul's doctrine you remember you're resisting God's latest information to us through his latest apostle to us the Acts 28 philosophy I can call it a theory it misses all of that. What about Acts 2? Acts 2 philosophy misses the start of the body of Christ, claiming it started with Christ's resurrection or with his uh, crucifixion or his ascension or Christ's Acts 2.33 shedding of the Holy Ghost on the, the believing Jews. In so doing, they must incorporate into Scripture the mystery body of Christ uh, in, into what they think it started uh, back around the cross sometime or soon after. Uh, they, they have to incorporate back into that time period the body of Christ that was still a secret, was not even told about then, but they have to include it. Uh, that's why when, when you try and witness to somebody or tell them the gospel and they 
They're thinking the church started back at the crucifixion or the resurrection. They, they're hesitant. So, um, when they do, when, uh, when people choose the Acts two time period, there, uh, the, they have to include the doctrines of Israel's last days, as happening back then. Well, <laughs> if you look at Acts two sixteen to seventeen, the, uh, Peter said this is that he was he was reading out of Joel. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it came to pass. It shall come to pass. It says in the last days. Now, yeah, it's it's a little different in. Uh, In, in the uh, prophet, what do you call it? In, in jo the book of Joel, two, I think it's 2.28. Uh, you don't have to go there, but uh, it shall come to pass in the last days. There, there's a difference. I'm trying to read through it again in my... Uh, I'm going to let that go. Um, there's It's a minor difference. It's... Uh, quoted as scripture so we know it's true uh, the mid-acts understanding of the start of the body of Christ correctly places it in Acts 9 verse 6 with the salvation of Paul as the first to be saved by Christ's new pattern of salvation as a person unforgivable in Israel's doctrine and look at these verses three verses here uh, Romans 5 6 then Romans 5 8 and then 1st Timothy 1 15 starting with Romans 5 6 for when we were yet without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly well that describes Paul on the road to Damascus killing saints taking part in the stoning of Stephen as an accomplice um, Christ died for the ungodly. That's different than uh, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't get ourselves to a non-sinner non state somehow and then we're good enough for God to save us. No. God looked for sinners and we fit the bill. First Timothy 1.15 This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. There it is again. Multiple times. Not law keepers. Not the righteous. Not goody two shoes. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief, Paul said, or Saul at the time. M or, no, when he wrote uh, Timothy, he was, or when he was written to, let's go on. <laughs> uh, but chief, the word chief in the next verse is translated first. So what he's talking about is chief, not uh Worst doesn't say worst. It says chief, meaning uh, the head of the line, uh, the chieftain, um, first in that sense. So, uh, how be it, verse 16, First Timothy 1, 16, how be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first. And the word first is the same word as chief in the previous verse. Christ, the head of the body, but Paul was the head of the line, uh, the chief, or the first to be saved into the body of Christ. Paul was the first to be saved by Christ's new pattern. He says, uh, Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern. And they'll argue you about that verse. Uh, it says, for a pattern, 
not as a pattern. The long suffering is not the pattern. The pattern was for uh, the long excuse me the long suffering was for a pattern. And Paul goes on to tell how to follow that pattern. For a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. That's the pattern. It's different than bring your tithes and offerings and your goat to slaughter on the altar. It's uh, it's different. <laughs> Just believe on him that that he did all the work. He did the dying that was required as payment for your the wages of sin is death. And that's the pattern that Christ started with Paul. It's called the mystery of Christ. After Christ had ascended to heaven, he came back and saved Paul in an unexpected way that he had kept secret until that time. When Paul saw Jesus, he had to be thinking, if that truly is Jesus uh, having been resurrected, then he himself, Paul, should have been struck dead immediately as Ananias and Sapphira were. Paul had to be thinking, Jesus was right. I was wrong. I should be dead now. Paul was trembling and astonished, and that explains why. But he was still alive, though. And that was our only hope of salvation today. And we can't be saved by abiding by laws or by blessing Israel or even by believing that Christ died for the sins of mankind, was buried and rose again. Paul said that salvation is not by just believing those facts to be true, but rather to, and he uses the word, receive. Receive Christ's death as sufficient for your sins in God's eyes to, so that he saves you from that, by that, by your belief. You're, you're receiving it you say, to save you instead of anything you might be trying to do for righteousness. Y there's no way to be as good as God, which is the requirement, except if he imputes his righteousness to you, which he does when you receive that gospel, that Christ died for your sins, they're all died for. Nothing left for you to try and attain to. Uh, Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again, and was seen. Verse 5. Don't forget, there's no period before verse 5. It's part of the same sentence. He was seen. He appeared. Documented. All right. Well, I'm done for tonight, and... Uh, Hope to be back Thursday with uh, the next lesson. Any comments or questions? Bring them right up.